Today he's going to be, I guess, sharing a little bit more about some of the research that he's done within uh, the past few months or years, perhaps. Um, yeah, a few, two, two, three years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and maybe uh, uh, hopefully draw uh, a little bit more about some of the challenges in re uh, conducting this research and uh, some of the implications uh, of, of, of methodology, research methodologies today. Um, what we'll do is we'll have Simon speak for about uh, 20 minutes, okay. thereabouts. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, after his presentation, we'll have just a very short five-minute session, just in case you have any questions to clarify. Uh, then that will be followed by our second presentation, uh, which is by Ong Fang Tung. She is actually a conservator at the National Archives of Singapore, and she's uh, done uh, some interesting presentations and research about uh, what it means to actually conserve and preserve uh, Southeast Asian collections today, uh, you know, some of the, uh, uh, you know, these collections they are inherited, so how do we actually conserve them for a, a very unusual climate and setting that we have uh, here in Singapore. So then we'll have a short five minutes after the presentation to clarify some of this stuff, and then hopefully uh, we'll have an interesting discussion after that between both uh, panelists and yourselves as well. This is very informal, uh, if you feel like stretching your feet, so then standing up and walking around, please do so. Uh, we'll be taking photos of the session today. They won't be published, but if you're uncomfortable to have uh, yourself featured in any of these photos, please let us know as well. Uh, it will also be recorded, yes, uh, also for internal purposes as well. So without further ado, um, we'll have Simon kick us off. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Thanks, Nasri. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, very, very excited to sort of like be here. Yeah, I mean, if I was sort of like given the opportunity, I would get everyone to sit on the floor uh, just to sort of like make it more informal. Uh, but uh, so today, I guess, uh, yesterday I've sort of like given the workshop. And today I'm going to sort of focus more on a research project that I've been working on. And it's a way to also sort of like think and reflect on actually the kinds of like collaborations that have been sort of like fostering. Uh, and you know something like this would not have sort of like happened, or the kind of materials I, I found would not have uh, been possible without actually the help of many many different sort of like colleagues. And incidentally, you know Nasri is a big help. He put me in touch with a curator at uh, the Vokin Kun Museum. Uh, who actually shared so much sort of information with me and really sort of, you know, helped me clarify a lot of the questions that I had regarding this painting that you're seeing on the floor and also the amount of sort of like materials that actually the National Archive of Singapore have been sharing online have been uh, very uh, central to, uh, to helping me sort of like uh, frame a lot of the sort of like questions that would result in what, I've, uh, what the, the story I'm able to sort of like tell. So it's, it's nice to maybe sort of like use this uh, research project to, you know, have the, to, to sort of like lead us into the conversation that we want to sort of like have. So principally, um, I wear very many different hats at the sort of like visual art program. Uh, sometimes I am a, a historian. Uh, at other times, I also sort of like run an independent sort of like archive at the uh, Common Malaysian Design Archive, where we sort of like archive visual cultural materials in KL. But I'm also occasionally an artist, surprisingly. Uh, that's a new thing that has sort of like happened. And in some ways, this project itself uh, brings together Actually, it's a, uh, this research project in some ways sort of like, you know, it's a, it's a convergence of all these sort of like different practices that I've been involved in, right? And uh, I was sort of like working on a research project principally to sort of trace the history of the Muharram procession that used to take place even in Singapore, and, uh, but I was focusing on Penang. Uh, in, uh, and this is a festival that would happen on the first 10 days of the Islamic New Year. Right, uh, so the Muharram is the sort of like the first month of the Islamic New Year, and the first ten days normally uh, there will be this sort of like huge celebration where a procession is sort of like staged in a in pretty much almost every sort of like colonial port cities around the world, and it was sort of like it, it was circulated around the world because principally of the invented sort of like labor system that was brought into place during the 19th century by the British. And, uh, and to some extent also the French sort of like colonies. And uh, so I was very curious about, you know, why it sort of like, you know, became often a site where a lot of protests 
takes place. Uh, and this was also a very cross-ethnic kind of like festival. It became almost like an open-ended kind of open open source kind of like platform or festival where people just join in. And you do, no matter what kind of race, what kind of religion that you have, it just so happened that this festival accommodated everyone. And it became a, a means for different communities to sort of like participate and voice out their sort of like displeasure against the colonial sort of like government. Uh, and very often riots happen during this for sort of like, you know, after the festival itself. And uh, as I was sort of like doing this research, I was also realizing that maybe the kind of like story that people tell about where the origin of this festival was is in Penang, from Penang at least, it's always sort of like traced through Bengkulu. So it's from India to Bengkulu, then from the sort of like convict laborers in Bengkulu that get, got transferred into Penang when the British went over and started Penang as a port city. Uh, that festival sort of like got brought over there. But uh, I also sort of then, as I was sort of like doing my research, I found out that, hey, actually maybe Aceh could be a sort of like different sort of like route because it has an earlier history where the, uh, the native infantry, the Sultan itself, the Sultan of Aceh were already hiring native infantry from India uh, back in the 18th century. Uh, this is way before the British sort of like even uh, set up Bengkulu. And so there was possibly another sort of like, uh, and you could tell by the kind of like the naming of the, of the months in Aceh, right? The first month in Aceh is always, uh, it's called Bulan uh, Asan Hussein which means uh, Bulan, Hassan, and Hussein, the two martyrs, uh, Islamic martyrs who are grandchildren of the Prophet Muhammad, who, was, uh, uh, who, who died in, uh, well, Has Hussein died in the sort of like battlefield and he was sort of like commemorated uh, as this sort of like Islamic martyr and a symbol of sort of like the injustices. Uh, a universal sort of like symbol of sort of like injustice. And, um, and I'm sort of like very curious, you know, how, uh, if there is, this kind of like Aceh connection, how, what, what kind of materials I could sort of like find. And just so happened that uh, uh, Mar Mariam, uh, uh, I was looking at some of these materials and this set of images sort of like pop up in the internet. So my research always begins on the internet because I'm very lazy and also because I work in a public university that doesn't have a lot of funds for me to sort of like travel overseas, right? So I always take all these opportunities to start my research uh, on, on online platforms. And uh, as I was sort of leafing through like, you know, the Dutch collection, I found this sort of like set of 14 paintings. Uh, all I know about them back then was that they're painted before 1907. Yeah? And it's by this person like, that goes by the name Tengku Tengo. Uh, that doesn't sort of like Tengku Tengo. So it doesn't say very much about anything at all. Uh, and Tengo just means middle. So it's, it's probably a sort of like nickname or something like that or title or his title. Uh, uh, but we know that he's from this part of uh, Aceh, which is that little X there, the red X that points, points to the Pate or Pet Pate. Uh, and then Kota Raja is where Bandar Aceh is. That's the main sort of like capital. And he painted these 14 sort of like sets of painting and these paintings or watercolor, uh, as well as sort of like crayon drawings, ended up in the Volkenku Museum, which is the folk sort of like museum in Leiden. Uh, and that's, that, uh, that's the only sort of like information that we really sort of like have uh, online. And so when I learned that Miriam, the curator, was coming to sort of like Singapore to speak at the Hajj conference, my first thing was uh, I WhatsApp Nasri straight away and said, no, you have to sort of like put me in touch with her. I really, really need to sort of like speak to her. And she kindly agreed to sort of like put me in touch. And she very kindly shared a master's thesis that's been written about uh, 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 this particular sort of like set of paintings. And that gave me a bit more information on at least the context, the colonial sort of like context in which the paintings were acquired by the museum. And, uh, and, uh, and I think what interests me about this sort of like set of paintings is principally they are mostly these uh, figures of the Bura. Uh, 
you know, uh, taking it almost sort of like a center stage within the painting. And around the burak, then you get to sort of like see little sort of like mini episodes or sort of like things happening. And they're normally sort of quite comic kind of like scenes, right? You have like people sort of like coming back from shopping and then there's people sort of like tending to a tree, but always very comical in the sense that an accident has sort of like happened and they're all sort of like fumbling around trying to sort of like get things right back into sort of like order. And but amidst all this sort of like, you know, the hula balu that's sort of like happening in, uh, uh, around the sort of like burat, uh, what you also get is also uh, a sense, uh, in some of the paintings, the burat started wearing a cloth. Uh, 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 around the neck. So I was principally intrigued by, you know, why are the Buraks sort of like wearing a clock all of a sudden? Uh, and that really sort of like uh, was the main sort of like driving question uh, for this research. Uh, I think one of the paintings was actually also shown at the Asian Civilizations Museum maybe recently. Oh, is it still shown there? I, I'm not sure. Uh, oh yeah, uh, when they opened the Islamic wing, the new Islamic wing, I think they brought down, I, I think they loaned one of the Burak paintings and, sh uh, and that was included in their ex opening ex sort of like exhibition. Uh, and I was sort of uh, keen to sort of like find out, you know, why Buraks all of a sudden are wearing clocks, right? And um, so that required me to sort of like perhaps also understand what is the context of the Burak in this part of the world? What do they sort of like signify or what do they mean? And um, I was sort of like, you know, digging more about the Burak. I found out that hey, it turns out that they're pretty sort of like common and prevalent sort of iconography in this part of the world. And as you can see, uh, you know, in the sort of like National Museum of the Philippines and even the Tropen Museum, you have sort of like the Burak as sort of grave decoration. You also have the Burak sort of like as a sort of like, you know, piece of sort of like sculpture, you know, made into sort of like a sculpture, used for sort of like ceremonial or sort of like ritual events. Uh, or you can also find Burak in illustrated sort of like magazine, uh, a manuscript, sorry, not magazines. Uh, uh, and this is from uh, Bonnet. Uh, and if you are interested in sort of like the Malay manuscript sort of like culture in this part of the world, I think the best blog, uh, for those of you who don't know, is the British Library sort of like blog on, you know, Malay manuscript run by Annabelle Tay Bialat, right, uh, I, which I, I follow religiously uh, and in which she sort of like uh, uh, actually highlighted this particular uh, work. Uh, then there is also in the Javanese context, uh, also, you, you have sort of like the bubra, a uh, sort of like wing horse-like creature that appeared uh, in a sort of like story uh, called Sela, uh, Serat, Sela, Serat Sela Rasa. Um, uh, of course, this is, I don't know, I don't think it's named as a bura, but it does sort of like take on feature of a sort of like wing horse. And so uh, it's a matter of sort of like speculation where all these sort of like wing hybrid composite sort of like myth mystical creature uh, and they're sort of like, you know, very kind of like fluid association with sort of like one another in terms of its iconographic sort of like attribution. Uh, what do they sort of like amount to? And I'll show you a few more things. And of course, then there's the magic flying horse in Wayang, as well as sort of like, you know, the Arika sort of like nutcracker. I very quickly go through this. Then also the Burak sort of like flanking a tree of life that appeared in the, the Tirai or the Plamin. Uh, the, 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 of, of the sort of like, uh, of the wedding sort of like bed. And, and sometimes the Burak is in some ways associated or connected in some ways to this idea of the celestial sort of like rooster, right? So rather than thinking of sort of like of syncretism or sort of like hybrid, or hybridity or sort of like hybridism or things like that, uh, I was sort of like trying to think through this idea of the composite sort of like nature, right? Where you can sort of like piece things together. And then they sort of like come together for a while, they disassemble, and then they sort of like form, constitute another sort of like thing when they sort of like reassemble again. And, and, and that creole sort of like nature of sort of like uh, of icons consolidating and sort of like disconsolidating and containing sort of like multiple sort of like references existing along a sort of like spectrum is what I'm sort of like very curious about this burak because then how is the burak collect, connected to you know these kinds of like wing more sort of like uh, bird like sort of like creature when is it a horse when is it a sort of like bird and 
Uh, this is another photo of that. And, and how is it then sort of ultimately connected to this larger kind of like mythology of the Prophet Muhammad sort of like ascension into sort of like the heaven, right? Uh, uh, and, uh, and all that sort of like sort of questions uh, one is sort of like clear. And ultimately then also how it li relates to a processional sort of like culture. So this sort of like set of images comes from uh, Patani and Kelantan where you in up to the 1930s, I think there was this sort of like processional culture where uh, a form of uh, what is called the burung patala or the, or the tiered roof, um, tiered roof sort of like bird, giant bird, uh, are normally sort of like processed down the streets uh, and taken and sort of like around town. Uh, often uh, connected to circumcision sort of like ceremonies of princes, stuff like that. Uh, in Kelantan and sort of Petani. Uh, and, but in this sort of like instance, it takes on a more bird-like kind of like appearance. Whereas in other instances, it takes on horse-like sort of like appearances. And not of, they're not often sort of like considered as, on, or they're not often sort of like named as sort of like Burak, but then have features that are sort of in some ways associated with it, right? Or that's large form, and you can just take on a minuscule sort of like form this Acheni sort of like ring, finger ring, for example, that was also sort of like found in the Vulcan Kun sort of like museum where you have the burak in the form of a sort of tiny little sort of ring. Uh, 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 and this belongs to probably one of the minor, what you call Uli Balang, uh, which is like a, uh, how do you call it? What is uh, Ulu Balang? Maybe like a, or a, what's the best way to translate that? Ulu Balang. Like Uli Bala, Ulu Bala, maybe Orang Kaya. How do you translate Orang Kaya? Like an advisor? No, they're not really advisors, right? They're big men. They're, they're sort of like thief lords. Yeah, 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 I don't know how do you call it. <laughs> how, do you, how do you translate Ulu Bala? Or Orang Kaya, how do you normally translate Orang Kaya in the Malay context? Okay. But it literally means rich person. Uh, yeah, it means rich person. Anyway, you have money. La. Basically, you have enough money, you can sort of like have your own turf, right? So you're a boss. You're a boss. You're like a boss. Uh, all right, it can appear on the cloth uh, in, you know, a batik sort of like a cerebot. Uh, but uh, it also plays an important sort of like, it takes on an important sort of like uh, role within the tabut or the muharram kind of like celebration, where often it is sort of included in the tabut that is often constructed during the muharram. So what's so interesting about the muharram for me, I mean, besides, you know, it's different from, for example, chinge, right? Or it's very different from, say, taipusam. Uh, sort of like a uh, procession uh, in the sense that or during the Muhammad celebration, uh, they would often build this thing called a tabut. In India, it's called a tazia. Uh, and it's basically a sort of like tomb. Uh, it's, a represent, it's a representation of the sort of like tomb of the sort of like the two martyr sort of like uh, figures that the Muharram is meant to sort of like commemorate. Basically, principally Hussein and Hassan. Uh, Right? And, and it takes on very sort of like abstract sort of quality. And so you see here in this sort of like very, in this Malay world uh, uh, representation of sort of like the tabut, it's also very different from say, uh, the kind of like tabut construction that you see in India. Here, it takes on a very floral kind of like quality. And in fact, what I just found out maybe four, four, four or five days ago is that there's apparently a plant, a flower in the Malay world that is called a tabut, and it looks exactly almost like this. Uh, so, uh, uh, and, and I will show you how it actually looks like in a video. There's a surviving video from Singapore uh, that actually sort of like shows a tabut and, uh, and, and, and how similar it is to a sort of like a plant. Okay, so, uh, so the burak plays a sort of like central role. You see him, you see the burak sort of like here. I'm, I sort of like enlarge the picture of it where it is sort of like shown as a figure or a mythical sort of like being that's actually sort of like burying the tabut. So very often, uh, I think with the MA sort of like thesis that was sort of like written by a lady called Stephanie, she has sort of like suggested that perhaps that set of paintings drew references from uh, a tradition in which uh, talismanic kind of like drawings 
are pasted on the walls of sort of uh, museum, uh, sorry, uh, mosque in Aceh. So this is one example of the kind of talismanic drawings uh, that you would sort of like find in uh, walls of sort of like museums, uh, for sort of walls of sort of like mosques in sort of Aceh. Um, but of course, the kind of drawing is tend to be more sort of like schematic, right? Uh, it looks very graphic and it takes on uh, more sort of like abstract. It has a more sort of like abstract quality, except, uh, but, uh, what you see here in the painting is entirely sort of like different in the sense that uh, it has a more sort of like caricature kind of like uh, as sort of like look to it and it's a lot more sort of like animated uh, and it also shows events whereas in the sort of like schematic diagramic diagrammatic kind of like drawing it's very sort of like it's a singular sort of like burat object that you know, uh, that's painted on, you know, just a sheet of paper. Whereas now you see things and activities sort of like happening in the painting itself. It shows life, it shows story, it shows that things are sort of like moving. It has a narrative. It takes on a narrative sort of like quality. And uh, we know that this set of paintings was ultimately shown in uh, this exhibition in 1924, uh, in 1907 and 1924, and reshown in 1924. Uh, of the collection belonging to this uh, figure called Feldman. Feldman. Uh, and he is, you know, one of the chief of the uh, very brutal kind of like uh, mercenary sort of, uh, very brutal sort of like militia uh, of, of the Dutch militia that actually uh, successfully waged a sort of like anti, uh, anti sort of like Aceh sort of campaign that uh, uh, secured Aceh for the Dutch. And so he clearly sort of like um, murdered a lot of people and actually sort of like was recognized uh, uh, for his sort of like contribution for all the, the work that he does. For, uh, he was recognized by the Dutch sort of like government for his, and the Dutch empire for his sort of like contribution to, 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 secure, to winning the sort of like Aceh war. And, uh, and clearly he gained a lot of spoils out of it. And a large part of this collection was then sort of sent back to the Volcan Kuhn sort of like museum and was staged uh, 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 in, two sort of, uh, in two sort of like, uh, that this photograph uh, uh, is, uh, shows of the 19 sort of like 07 exhibition. And uh, so where was I going with this? Uh, okay, I'm gonna sort of like skip that. Uh, uh, and this is just to sort of like give you a sense of uh, another work, uh, another Muharram sort of like scroll painting, which you can see at the Asi Asian Civilization sort of like museum currently on show now, which I think they acquired maybe last year or something like that. Uh, to give you a sense that there is in some ways some connection happening uh, between uh, the kind of like the way things are sort of like uh, depicted in the Acheni sort of like painting and an earlier sort of like Madras sort of scroll painting from 18 sort of like 40s. And if you sort of like do maybe a deeper kind of like iconographic kind of analysis, chances are you also get to see similar kind of like taboot construction. If you sort of consider it to what you would normally sort of find in Northern Indian kind of like tab or tazia or tab taboot kind of construction, which often takes on the Mughal kind of like or the Taj kind of like mosque design with the onion dome, right? And then even the Calicut sort of like school of painting, uh, where you, where, which is sort of in, Cal in Calcutta, where it's sort of like up north, this type of sort of like construction tends to be associated with the northern sort of like school. And you see the southern sort of like school of painting capturing an entirely different sort of like set of visual vocabulary that's connected to the taboo, okay? And I was sort of like very curious where is all this thing coming from? And then I think everything ends up and converges in the construction of this new mosque in Aceh. And uh, one of the most sort of like, one of the things I, that, that took me a while to sort of like, you know, that, to, to sort of like realize is that uh, with the construction of this mosque, after the, in order to sort of like secure the confidence of the Achenese after the Dutch have sort of like taken over Aceh, the first thing they did was to sort of like sponsor the building of a sort of like new mosque. In fact, this kind of like mosque design was not viewed favorably by the sort of like local population because it was so familiar and unf so unfamiliar 
to uh, the local sort of like population, right? Because if you know of the Nusantara Mosque, it's a tiered roof kind of like construction. So it took them a while to sort of like adapt to this thing. But uh, this early photograph sort of like uh, points to something very interesting. Suddenly in this mosque, there's also something new that's introduced to the Archini sort of like conception of sort of like time. First, you see at the sort of like uh, pediment, there is a clock there. So the introduction of sort of like Western sort of like conception of time is then sort of like, you know, introduced within sort of Archini society to sort of like regulate them and sort of like bring them into this sort of like capitalist sort of like idea of sort of the homogenous empty time, right? They regulate sort of like their workflow and their work hour and sort of like things like that. And even the whole sort of like prayer and ritual and stuff like that will now be timed according to this new sort of like clock system that was sort of like introduced into Aceh. And my sort of like, uh, you know, it became also a board game and stuff like that. Uh, and this is uh, uh, from uh, the Rights Museum. You can even download like, you know, high-res images and use it for whatever you want. Uh, and it also like, uh, you know, the conquering of, you know, all these sort of like heritage space and the turning of sort of uh, Aceh into a sort of like museum as a result of that. Uh, Principally, this was achieved through securing, through deposing the sultan, and then securing the, uh, securing the, the consent of all the uli balangs, which is all the orangkayas who agree to collaborate and work with the Dutch. Uh, and what you see here is basically a photograph that represents their sort of like, that's supposed to represent their sort of like subjugation. The standard narrative is that because they collaborated with the Dutch, therefore they have sort of like, you know, sold themselves into this kind of like a system of sort of like subjugation. But I think recent scholars are sort of like challenging this sort of narrative, you know, you might, given, if you put yourself and imagine yourself in that sort of like situation where you're faced with an all power, powerful kind of like, you know, militia force, I mean, would you not sort of just nod your head and agree to things for that moment? and then sort of maybe choose your battle to fight at another day. Uh, and this way of sort of like thinking, uh, having a more sort of like empathetic sort of like uh, way of understanding the kind of difficult situation that all these Uli Balans are sort of like facing at a particular point in time in choosing wh uh, whether to outright rebel or, you know, or work collaboratively with the Dutch government and then sort of institute some kind of rebellion from within the system is something that scholars are, are continuing to sort of like explore these days and finding very interesting kind of like uh, research. Uh, a lot of interesting research are coming out in this sort of like area. But I think it also travels sort of outwards which it exists in Penang, in places like Penang, which is very closely sort of like tightly knit into the Archeni sort of like world. And you see here in the uh, Diamond sort of like Jubilee sort of celebration, you have uh, the Nusantara Mosque like sort of like construction existing as this sort of like moving tabun. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, as a sort of, sort of processional vehicle during this sort of celebration. And ultimately in here. It's the only sort of surviving video of the tabu. And if you look at, uh, I, I should tell you this because uh, maybe you can fix this. Uh, on the website of uh, the audiovisual uh, kind of materials that uh, National Archive has been sharing, uh, very generously, of course, uh, uh, this has been labeled as a Chinese New Year festival. <laughs> I, I can understand why, because you'll see a Chinese lion, uh, Chinese uh, lion dance there. And it's very common in Tabut celebrations to sort of use the lion dance as a kind of like motif because of its association with Machan Ali, which is the tiger or the, the it, which is the lion or sort of like Ali, a symbol that's connected to uh, the son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad. So uh, somewhere along there, there was sort of like a lion dance and that's why the curator very diligently noted down this could have been a Chinese New Year sort of like festival. But if you sort of like look at what the kinds of like, uh, oh, it's over now. But if you have sort of like seen uh, what was sort of like being shown just now, what you would have gotten also is a sense that 
uh, of all the sort of like iconographies that I was talking about, the kind of like moss-like construction, the kind of like taboo like floral-like sort of like uh, structure that was effigy that was sort of like built for that procession itself. And I, uh, ending this, I think, would sort of like be a nice way to seg into our, uh, 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 our sort of like further conversation and have someone from the archive take over and show us more exciting stuff that we can find in the archive. Okay. Um. Okay, sorry, I can't hear myself. I'm not used to hearing myself. Um, so, so thank you for coming. Um, I was quite surprised when Nasri like emailed me out of the blue months months ago on coming here. But then when I saw that I'm going to be speaking alongside Simon, I immediately said yes. Yeah. So, so here I am, and um, I may not be speaking exactly what you're expecting, but I do hope that still some interesting things that you'll be um, seeing from here as well. So, um, also, I'm a conservator, so does anybody know what does a conservator do? Okay, so I don't really have to explain too much, right? Because when I say I do conservation, people will say, Oh, forest? Water? <laughs> animals? I'm like, energy? I'm like, uh, no, not quite. It's, it's an, uh, heritage conservation. So, um, I specialize in books and paper conservation. And um, just some quick definitions on these words that sometimes are used interchangeably among people as well. So preservation is the overarching um, of all activities that we do um, to, to preserve our materials, including policy making as well. So uh, whereas conservation and restoration, depending on where you are, in some countries, they just call them restorers, some call them conservators. But in certain parts of, of the world, um, they draw a fine line between conservator and restorer because they mean slightly different things. So, one example that I always like to use is that conservators, what you see in the museums, those are conserved materials. But restorers, there's always this line about restoring things to their former glory. So an example I always use is that if I give you a book that's 200 years old, after conservation, it looks like 200 years old. You don't take away its age, you stabilize the condition. And um, you don't try to modify too much just that it will influence the interpretation of the material itself. Whereas for restoration, after restoration, the book will look like 20 years old instead. <laughs> but of course, it depends on the function of the material. And is it for personal use? Is it for collector's item? Is it an um, art material artifact? And is it a museum artifact itself? So that's when uh, it differs to the extent of what um, the owner wants or institution wants or what do we do to it. So again on conservation, um, three main aspects of conservation. Interventive, interventive conservation is, as what it says itself, is interventive. So you actually work on the materials themselves, uh, repairing tests, filling in the holes, and cleaning, uh, or even doing washing. We actually wash paper, you'll be surprised, even though it's so fragile when it's wet. Uh, whereas preventive conservation is everything to do with it without actual working on the material. So that includes things like housing, storage, transportation, and the right kind of storage, even for Exhibition mounting, how do we place them in this and that? Why is the light, why is all the exhibitions so dim and dark? Okay, of course, uh, there are reasons behind why, why we try to do that as well. So, whereas the other branch people like to talk about is conservation science, uh, whereby you do more scientific and analytic research on the materials. But of course, I like to use what my ex boss say as informative conservation because it includes continuous professional development because always keep me up with the latest development in the industry and not just um, saying stagnant because you want to do the best that you can with your knowledge and your resources to preserve the materials including things like advocacy what I'm doing right now yep. I should pull this closer oops yeah so just a just a quick over here I'm, I'm sorry I'm gonna start with a corporate slide template yeah it's, it's, a, it's a requirement <laughs> So, uh, so an overview of what I'll be sharing is um, the different kind of variety of the materials that we see in the Southeast Asia, the common problems that we face, um, environmental control standards, and the Southeast Asia situation. So on the variety of materials, I actually went to all over the different institutions and museums to take a lot of photos, but I realized that Roots has nicer photos than I do, so <laughs> here it is. <laughs> yeah. So even though of our National Archives, we have the main part of the Strait Settlements records, uh, I chose to just pluck it off Roots itself because I do not want to have the watermark National Archives of Singapore across, <laughs> across our, our own records. So 
So what example that you see here, this is actually, um, uh, is it a title deed? It's a, it's a legal record of the trade settlements. And by National Archive definition, everything that's before the self-governance in the 1950s falls under trade settlements records. So it's with this R department, whereas the records department can uh, take care of modern government records. So, and beside, beside, aside from, despite us being an Asian country, um, and Southeast Asia has very much been colonized by the British, the Dutch, the French, the, the Spanish and as well. Which is why you see that even though we are in Asia, we are not quite like China, Korea, Japan and all that because the papers that we have here is actually Western made paper, Western machine made paper and it is made in the West before it got shipped over here. So of course, um, being thrown in a different climatic environment, it responds differently and therefore um, it causes more issues and likewise, this is an iron girl ink so you sort of like can see through below and it's not because the paper quality is bad okay, the paper quality is bad but of course, uh, it's made worse by the iron girl ink because the iron girl ink um, is, a, is a recipe made from the West so unlike using our carbon ink, iron girl ink actually corrodes easily so that's what we call ink corrosion and it eats at the paper so you might have seen some papers whereby there's like holes completely bore through the paper itself. That's due to the iron gout ink corrosion. So that's when they don't really like our environment. Which is why if you use be it Chinese ink or Indian ink, it's actually the same thing, it's carbon ink. So I usually just say carbon ink because by saying India ink or Chinese ink, it has reference to its origin and where it was made. So carbon ink is very stable. So yeah, use carbon ink if you like to write things. So other things in our so as a big paper conservator, all my things will be paper focused. So there are things like maps, maps also for on the paper, banknotes, um, books, publications, photographs. So this is actually a postcard, uh, postcard photograph. There was a period of time it was popular to send them off. So these photographs instead of the paper back, they actually back it with paper so that people can actually write and mail it off to somebody else. And that's quite a very bad case of water damage and fading. So, palm leaf manuscripts, all the palm leaf manuscripts in Singapore are not from Singapore because no, nobody writes palm leaf manuscripts in Singapore even during the early days. So they are from Sri Lanka, from, from India, from Java and various other places. But of, course that, but of course, since I'm talking about Southeast Asia collection, I shared the palm leaf manuscript because it's a unique type of I would say book, a unique type of book that we have in Southeast Asia that is not in other parts of Asia. And there is a huge collection in various um, Southeast Asia archives and museums. Um, manuscripts. Manuscripts are part of how I got into conservation because I was attracted by the Western Illuminated Manuscript. But of course, we have the Asian ones as well. Random documents, okay, it has a lot of different media. There's paper, there's photograph. There's printing ink, typewriter ink, fountain pen ink, there's lots of things on it. So even though it's small and insignificant at that point in time, um, for the researchers and historians, all these form parts and pieces of a story uh, of what they can find out as well. So, and as a conservator, the right identification will help towards um, choosing the right course of action or treatment for the materials. Also because I realized I have 20 instead of 30 minutes, so I'll be rushing through some other slides later on that's a bit more less important. That's a very sad looking photograph. And of course, in the collections, not forgetting artworks, artworks on paper. So on top, what you have is actually a, a woodcut by Lim Yu Kuan. He's the second principal of NAFA. And, um, and at the bottom, slightly different from what you usually see, that's actually from Ong King Sein. King, uh, and that's actually Night and Ubi in a watercolor. It's a watercolorist that's uh, Singapore. Quran. So what you see, the real little pieces there is actually cloth. Cloth was pretty much used as the lining of a lot of books at that point in time and also for the Qurans. So actually by seeing the cloth and, and the white paper, you can tell that actually the board is lost, meaning the book cover itself is already gone. So that's definitely a lot of damage. And you can see this little flap there, that's only for Islamic manuscripts. Um, when you see this little flap, and you will see another one later on. I, I saw this on Roots. I'm not sure what it is. It looks like palm leaves inside, but it's wrapped up in something else. It just piqued my curiosity. So, so I was thinking, okay, it was photographed like this. Would they ever open it up? Um, how are they going to conserve it? Because this gave it its provenance, how it was being stored and kept. 
but then for conservation, if you want to assess the content or what's written and all that, do you really keep it in this format? So which is why conservators and curators and collection managers always have a lot of conversation on how do we store things, how do we present them to people, and how do we uh, uh, share with the people and display it as well. Something from Malay Heritage Center. I'm not sure why, but if you go to Roots, um, there's only 53 items from the Malay Heritage Center and they're all photographs. <laughs> so, so, um, so this is actually a document from yep, the Malay Heritage Center collection. And in fact, if you look at it, it's Western paper again, and there's iron going, there's printing ink, and look at that. Uh, Okay, broad edge pen. Because I, I I'm not gonna identify it correctly as, as Gothic or Factor, but in the broad edge pen there's actually a Western typography, a Western calligraphy style. But of course you have the Chinese well, the, the Islamic seals and the Arabic scripts written elsewhere as well. So if you have been to the exhibition here earlier, I think is this in this one or is this in it's just over here? Okay, yes, this is a telematic scroll. So as a conservator, I'm like, okay, what material is this? It's paper. What is the pigment on it? What are the things inside that, that makes it, it what it is? And of course, I look at other things. I look at mounting. I look at how is it being held or supported. So there's an eight ply mount board with a circular coat because you want to keep it in its natural shape and environment without forcing it too much. We don't like to roll them too tightly. And yet, of course, there is a little bit of inter interleave between the materials that you use. And of course, it's not just regular plastic that you buy from popular. We will always keep to archival material. And by archival, it usually just fulfill a few standards such as being pH neutral or higher. Um, it doesn't offset off gas too many volatile uh, VOCs, things like that. And you recognize something similar. This is at the ACM, another talismanic scroll. And because it's a permanent exhibition, um, they have a more solid uh, structure for mounting support, which is actually acrylic. And you can see from it, you see little, a little bit of folded cloth at the bottom to help support it, to prevent any static abrasion to the acrylic uh, support, but also to keep it supported as well. This is MHC's uh, permanent exhibition uh, over in the other building block. So as a conservator, I was like, ooh, it looks so sad. And, but as a conservator, there's this perverse excitement like, ooh, there's a lot of things that we can do to it. Okay. But of course, you're not changing or you're trying to change its interpretation too much as well. Because, yes, <laughs> I, I guess we get excited by different things, right? So for me, all I see is that there's a lot of soiling on this book. There's a very obvious um, past damage right on top, okay, burying through the whole book. There's pigment loss, there's water stains, there's a lot of things going on. Right? So giving, giving a little close-up, uh, what I really enjoy is that I noticed that um, that little thing there is called an N-band. And this is Islamic N-band. Because there are different kind of math, um, styles about the N-bands. And, and by identifying it, you can know that, oh, is this original binding or not? Because that, that also changes its context. They are, uh, Western manuscripts which is from the 12th century being rebound in the 16th century and again in the 18th century. So then, when you need to do conservation, do you put it back to its 16th or 12th century binding? Or if, if the binding is, is not appropriate and it's causing more damage or stress, do you actually opt for something else further? So, so I got very excited, but I'm not sure about that little ribbon stuff there and what's that tissue hanging out? Was there some previous repair or not? Yeah. Even though it's quite dirty, but it looks like it was red and green um, thread that was being used with Islamic and And you can see that, why is the spine not resting on the acrylic case? What's happening there, actually? And you can see that this spine, this is bound in a very uh, flat manner without any rounding of the block. So, if it really opens up the way where the acrylic cradle is, it's going to cause a lot of stress to where the opening, where the hinge is. So, Despite it being this, uh, made this way, it costs a lot for, to make um, a couple of acrylic cases. So what they actually did was having a little bit of a um, padding, okay, padding there to give it a little bit more support so it doesn't open up too much. Yep. Another one from MHC in the next block as well. So another book. Let's look at the book a little bit more. What else? Sorry. Yep. 
So this is what I mentioned earlier. And you can see that little thread there and this is the kind of details that as a council we really love and hope to preserve sometimes that even if we do conservation, we may or may not remove the thread because this is part of its own repair history. And that for the in area is actually the folio, the tab where we talk about only that only happens for Islamic manuscripts that's being folded in because they want to showcase another page. Um, which is why mounting is very important and choosing the right materials. You can see a little bit of a. The, sometimes the paper tears very easily, they are quite brittle. The damages that is a bit caused by the archival strip over, over there. And of course, the tears and the losses coming up, protruding from above. So, I hope you managed to catch some words just now about how I was trying to describe the different kind of damages. So, three main ones, right? Um, Mechanical, oops, is it coming? Mechanical, uh, uh, me uh, mechanical, chemical, and biological. Can anybody name some that you hear, heard me say just now? It's a very small, cozy group, right? Or is it going to be like a typical Singaporean? Okay, <laughs> okay, I, I guess it is. So, and the mechanical and physical damages, you have things like abrasions. Abrasions, uh, simply put, is just friction, okay? Uh, then accretion is basically just any foreign items. So let's say um, uh, uh, you were eating while you were reading a book and you drop some crumbs on it and then you close up the book. So when you open up later, when the conserver sees it, oh, that's accretion. So it can be any kind of foreign object that does not belong there. Okay? Yeah. So creases, the dust, the, then distortions, folds, losses. So we don't really say holes, we call them losses. So the material itself is called the support on which the information is on, so we call it support. So if there's a hole in the paper, we call it a support loss. Pigment loss will be the media itself. Chemical, I think you saw some of them just now. There's a lot of discoloration in paper that happens very easily. A lot of it is due to acidity. Okay, there's fading or darkening. So uh, discoloration can be more overall broad terming, but then fading and darkening will be more precise telling you that it is lighter or darker. Fading happens more for the textile, uh, cloth-bound <coughs> books, okay, or ink itself, watercolour, whereas darkening will, can be for leather, things like leather and sometimes paper as well, because when leather is wet and damaged, <coughs> it darkens. So, tight lines is a kind of water damage, except that it's usually at the edges of a material and it looks like the tide, that's why it's called tight line. But if it's just like a blah, water stain, we just call it water damage. As well. So sometimes we can be a bit more precise, but then that precision helps us to identify better. Biological is quite simple. Um, all the mold and the pests, etc. that you see itself. If you want, I can pass it to the slide, don't worry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, so I think everybody can tell what this is, right? What kind of damage is this? Uh, not necessarily. I'm not an expert, <laughs> but by looking at different kind of um, holes and damages, you can identify is it termite or silver fish or book loose and all that stuff. And the one on the far right actually, um, it's not just pest damage. Those brown things are actually excretion left by the, left by the pest. Okay? And it's very, very troublesome to remove. My, two of my colleagues are working on a book that has a lot of such damages. I'm like, good luck. I'm not sure how long it's going to take them. Um, familiar? I hope not actually, I hope you guys are not nodding your head because this is more, I hope you don't have this at home. <laughs> Please quickly call a conservator if you do. So, more itself is not just damaging for the materials but also for human. It can cause a lot of uh, respiratory problems in, in the person as well. And in fact, it also leaves stain. So, there's not just only green, green more. It's also brown, black, yellow, pink, purple. Yeah, I, I don't see any... Mm, yeah, it's pretty, pretty, pretty rainbow, right, the colours itself. So mold is very prevalent in our environment in the Southeast Asia context because we are very humid, uh, sad to say. And so this is an example of this coloration. <laughs> okay. And I'm not sure what's happening to that darker line in between there because this document was obviously folded at some point in time. And then um, the all this coloration of the paper due to the this due to the acidity. And that darkening itself could be due to actually heat damage as well. It seems like that for the uh, ages. And from the look of this, from my personal experience, this paper, especially the bottom half, is pretty brittle as well. So brittle books is quite tricky because right now there's still no good solution in the conservation world what to do with them. 
but we will keep the little pieces so that one day we can do jigsaw puzzle together. Yeah. This is foxing. This will be familiar to many people actually because this is in like almost everything after a while. Um, but yet, even though this is foxing, the left and right is different. Not, not, not just of the color. So the, the foxing in the middle, right, this is actually caused by mold, caused by dampness in the environment. Okay? But this is, not, this is unlike the mold, the colorful mold that we saw previously itself, which is actually on the surface, whereas this is between. So you can't really do anything to remove the mold here. Whereas the one on the right is due to impurities in the paper because in the paper making um, process itself, there's actually a lot of uh, metal impurities inside. And over time, in a uh, pollutive, pollutive, in, in, in a polluted environment, um, the metal elements corrode or, or rust, and then it causes a little brown spots. So even though both are called foxing, they are due to different causes, different reasons. But um, there's no good solution to this, uh, unfortunately. You can do something a bit more uh, interventive like bleaching, really area by area. If you over bleach, that part is going to appear too white instead. But bleaching actually, be it reducing or, or, or oxidizing bleach, um, it does cause more damage in the long run. So there's not much reasons behind it unless it's a piece of artwork. And then to you, the aesthetical quality matters so much that you really want to remove the spots, remove the foxing itself. Otherwise, uh, for some book collectors, they actually accept and embrace this foxing condition in the books. This is why conservators hate scotch tape. Please don't use scotch tape on your materials. Um, it's only a very, very temporary solution. Um, this, Aside from doing that quick repair, uh, over time, you can see that if it's done inappropriately, it actually causes creases and more damage. It stresses the area, localized area more, and also the adhesive itself, the glue also to speak. Um, over time, as it deteriorates and cross links, it actually stains and it penetrates the paper surface. So even if I remove the paper, the scotch tape carrier, the plastic area completely, that area is still darkened. Okay, so even if I use the right solvent and try to lighten it, um, that part of paper is already deteriorated. Conservation is not magic, we are not magicians. So our job is to retard the deterioration process, but we cannot turn back, uh, we cannot go back to the past. We can't really um, restore things as if um, back to when it was itself. Brito, this is Brito, Brito books. Very sad looking one, not just is it brittle, you can see there's a lot of dust, discoloration, surface dirt, there's a lot of iron gout encroaching going on as well. So these kind of books, we tend to just put them in an archival box and we keep it for future conservators. <laughs> when better technology comes along, because sometimes the more you do, the more damage you could be causing. So always know your own limitations, your resources, what is available, what is doable as well. And instead of like throwing them, ah, we can't read this anymore, let's just Chuck it out. We have a copy. Nah, uh, um, that's not how we, we, we tend to approach. So I guess since we're in Malay Heritage Center, right, let's look at more um, Islamic manuscripts. Um, I shall not say where this is from, uh, but this is taken by me. So this came across and I was asked to assess its condition. So two manuscripts, they look pretty not good, not bad, right? But wait till you take a closer look. Do you see what I see? No? <laughs> what? Someone say something? Ishan, what do you say? No? <laughs> what I say is pigment loss. Do you see it better now? Okay, so this is what we call by, um, uh, the pigment is media and what we call by pigment loss. And I think it also gives a hint as to that these pigments were actually made themselves, uh, made by the, the, the illuminator himself or herself because of the way it was maybe too much pigment and not enough binder or, or maybe the vehicle use was not appropriate or maybe the pigment itself was just not grounded finely enough so it's like a big block cake of um, pigment that's actually on the surface and of course um, it then gives rise to more abrasions and losses that can happen yep well, well we didn't really do an xrf to identify the correct pigment but just by judging from the shade of blue alone, it, it might be ultramarine. So another manuscript, right? <coughs> this is 
Do you see what I see now? Okay, so if let's say a, a one manuscript costs one thousand dollars <coughs> and it has a hundred pages, what do sellers do? Right? They will tear them apart, page for page. They will sell page by page. We will get them more money in return. So this is what happens to a lot of manuscripts in a lot of countries. They end up on eBay, a lot of do um, dodgy places and all that stuff. And it might, it might be the seller or it might be the collector who like, oh, I prefer this page. And they mount it, they choose to show this page. <coughs> so this is actually another page that was behind it, behind this manuscript itself that it shows that you don't get a C unless you remove the whole binding and the mounting itself. But of course then, what material is being used to mount it? That can also influence how safely we can remove it from its current stage as well. So I, I flip one corner for you to see. Do you see these little green brown spots area? Okay, so unlike the ink corrosion, this is not uh, iron, this is copper corrosion. So you wonder why is there copper corrosion in these places? So if you look at the front, it is where the greens are. So that itself also helps us identify the pigment without having to do any further testing more or less because this will be very likely be verdigris. So verdigris is a pigment used for many, many centuries, be it both in the East and the West. And verdigris is very easily being made. If you still have your one cent coins or something else, you just put it in vinegar or some stronger acid for months. Afterwards, you have all these little green powders. Copper corrosion. You scrape it off, you grind it very finely, you add your gum arabic, you add your uh, um, water and all that stuff, you have your green pigment. Which is why in different places sometimes it has it shows a different shade of green. So this is actually copper corrosion. Yes, you can see that it is really eating away at the hole itself, the paper itself, be it iron gout ink, be it iron corrosion or copper corrosion. And this is what it does to our materials. Um, okay, I'm going to skim through. I'm really way past my time. I just realized. So there are ten agents of deterioration. Okay, do I have all ten yet? No, no, no. Okay, so those in yellow, that's caused by human. Those in blue, that's by the environment. Okay, so if you look at it, isn't the environment uh, uh, um, determined by us as well? What kind of environment we put the materials in? So it means me and you are the culprit of the deterioration of, of all these materials, okay? So just talking about environment itself. So environmental control and monitoring is an activity carried out under preventive conservation to control and regulate the environment in which um, the collections are stored for its preservation. So it consists of the temperature. As we know, the higher the temperature, the faster the chemical reaction. Relative humidity is not your absolute humidity. So if you look at um, some of the readings, it could be 100% humidity outside, but it may not be 100% relative humidity because relative humidity is the moisture saturation. How much moisture that air can hold before it condenses? Okay. So air filtration and filtration, of course, pest monitoring. So I'm going to skip past NARA. NARA is the National, uh, National Administration of Records and, and Archives, for, which is actually the Ar National Archive of US. Um, as my focus is always on paper, you can see they recommend 18 degrees Celsius and 35 to 45 RH. Um, ISO, uh, British standards. Okay, so maybe just on this graph a little bit. My focus again on archival materials, um, cellulose and protein because paper are made of cellulose. There is no perfect relative humidity that you can place in for a mixed collection. Because if you want your paper and your cellulose materials to be steady at 50% RH, that's bad for metals, it's bad for unstable glass, which is why it's always a compromise. Because for every one degree Celsius change, you result in a change of 3% relative humidity. And it's an inverse relationship, inversely proportional relationship. So if the temperature dips by um, one degree Celsius, there's one degree Celsius colder, um, the relative humidity will increase by 3%. So it's going to get moisture. Yep. And of course, for every five degrees Celsius change, the rate of chemical reaction doubles. So which is why we, all the galleries are usually very cold, right? very dim. But yeah, if you look at certain display cases, they have their own little reading there. You can see the temperature and the relative humidity. So isn't that a scary thing, right? As a concept, it's quite scary. So looking at the Southeast Asia situation, it's a very messy chart, right? very confusing, but don't worry, I focus for you already. So look at the kind of climate that we are in. Okay, We are sometimes hot and humid, we are sometimes warm and humid. The color also also corresponds to 
what's good for them. And you can see we are quite in a danger zone. We are like orange. Okay. So which is why it's so tricky and difficult because we know we saw how actually a lower humidity and lower temperature um, is better for environment, yet those are very hard to achieve because it's um, a lot of energy consumption itself to keep it cold and dry. Because as you know, when it's colder, it's also wetter, right? Higher RH. But you want it drier and colder as well. And of course, practical factors such as the different collection formats, and this is just paper alone. You know, maps, building plans, uh, photographs, documents, applications as well. Other practical factors, infrastructure, is it all or new building? And be surprised, all buildings are actually harder to maintain the environment because of the, uh, how should I say? I'm not an architect. Um, okay, I'll just call it infrastructure. <laughs> because of the infrastructure of the old building, it's actually harder to maintain a good environment. Which is why all these old buildings, be it SAM, be it MHC and all that stuff, or trying to convert into a museum, it's hard to maintain the environment. It's going to cost a lot more money. And also because they are conserved building under PMB, they can't really like put in this additional chimney like structure here and there to put an aircon here and all that, because it's going to disrupt the whole look and feel of the conserved building itself as well. The size of the collection versus collection space, because every time everything you see in the exhibition space is usually 10 to 20% of what the actual collection size is of the institution, or even less. Air conditioning. So even though our storerooms, our repositories is 24-7, we can't do that for our home collections, right? Other practical factors, tropical climate. So example, thankfully, Singapore is quite safe from a lot of natural disasters. Uh, but Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei, Vietnam, they face a lot of earthquakes. Okay, floods, a lot of countries also has, has that as well. Volcanoes, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines have their volcanoes too. So thankfully, we only have the haze. So if you have good filtration, that helps bless a lot of our issue itself. Man-made disasters, pollution, which is why um, sometimes a lot of museums have their storage area away from the city, which I think Paris just built one recently, away from the main part of Paris, how many hectares of storage space of the materials. Resources, okay, we need money. Aircon also need money, right? Yes. Manpower, um, training expertise, because there's no conservation costs in the region. Um, well, even though there is a bit further out in terms of Asia, there is, but of course, it will not be a familiar language to most people. Korea, Japan, China, not everybody can speak Chinese, right? So, so there's that. And then, uh, I'll sum up with this slide. I'm just comparing the kind of different standards, given the challenges that we have, the different standards that other people are using, be it the UK, the US, but then, um, how then that, how, I would actually give a different suggestion for the ASEAN neighbours in, in a symposium two years ago. Um, is that we don't always have to adopt the international standard. Because the ISO, even though it's ISO, it's written by the Western countries. It's, it doesn't cater to our climate as, at, at all. So, um, which is a debate I had with my colleague who wanted to use the ISO in the ISO. I said, no, it doesn't apply to us. They're like, no, no, we should. I'm like, but, but it doesn't really make sense. Which is why, um, there is also one book about environmental control in um, the tropical climate. But all the examples are like Spain, Brazil, things like that, which, um, which I think I will want to read and research further into to see how much we can apply to our climate as well. Um, be it both being tropical, but then other, other concerns. Example, the collection type of materials that we have as well. So you can see that HCC, which is which houses the national collection of all the museums in Singapore, all the institutional museums in Singapore, is that they actually adjusted their values outside the ISO. We're no, long, no longer looking at 18 degrees Celsius and 50% RH. We're also looking at the carbon footprint as well, and they have adjusted to 23 degrees Celsius and 55% RH. Well, of course, 60, 65% and above RH will uh, encourage more growth. 80% and above, you're just inviting it to grow. So of course, there's always this balance that we need to do. That's why there's a lot of things like um, environmental monitoring, pest, man, uh, pest man management, that we also to try to make sure that uh, we're always keeping a lookout for anything that, that's unwelcome. So uh, I know it's quite dense, a lot of things, and not, maybe not quite expected, but I still hope you guys learn something new. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so two very uh, distinct <laughs> presentations, but I thought that there were some sort of interesting grounds for a sort of a shared 
dialogue about certain concerns. But um, before I uh, maybe sort of go into that, I actually just wanted to ask quickly, maybe for the benefit of everyone and also uh, to fulfill my own curiosity is when dealing uh, with uh, paper documents, uh, mm -hmm. or to use the example of Islamic manuscripts, mm -hmm. for example, could you talk a little bit about some of the considerations that guide your process of conserving or preserving something? Is it always, is it, I mean, to some extent it's aesthetic, especially when there's a curator and an exhibition involved, mm -hmm. but could you also maybe share about some of the ethical concerns, perhaps, and things like that? I'm thinking specifically in relation to maybe certain objects that we exhibit at the Malay Heritage Center. You used Korans as, as an example, and just to share, you know, when uh, when we're uh, dealing with members of the community, uh, you know, our, our, our embed is a little bit different from the Asian Civilizations mm -hmm. Museum. We would, you know, also look into things like Korans handed out as heirlooms, for example, mm -hmm. and you find with these objects there is a lot of uh, traces left behind by whoever used them, particularly mm -hmm. with Korans, because um, because you know they would often have. They would have ablution, and then so with this, they would handle them with you know uh, very wet hands and things like that. So, mm. what are the considerations as a conservator when dealing with these things? To what extent do you preserve these traces of use, mm. uh, or you know, or do we adhere strictly to a very puritanical sort of way of mm. wanting to exhibit something? Okay. Yeah. So on that ethical consideration, um, that's a good choice of word. I, I love that word because um, there is a code of ethics for our profession that we try to adhere to as well. So in terms of ethics, definitely um, knowing more about its provenance and background is very important for us so that you can then decide uh, what's most appropriate approach. So uh, for example, um, Okay, so there's a more very simple one like surface cleaning. Surface cleaning basically is just brushing away the surface dirt. Surface dust actually, because dirt is ingrained dust. If you get what I mean, which might, you might require more than just a brush. So we tend to use a soft uh, goat hair brush itself. But of course, in different parts of the processes of conservation, we have other kinds of hair in our brush. It could be weasel, squirrel, and then uh, um, for some of the Chinese and the Japanese brushes, they even have um, pig hair. So that's where we might actually avoid that use when we're dealing with Islamic manuscripts. Those are little things that we try to take into consideration when, when dealing with the materials. And of course, we don't, um, we don't work on a low-lying table because to my knowledge, Qurans need to be at above hip, hip level, right? You don't put them to low level as well. So those are little things that we have. And of course, as you mentioned, traces of use, that's when identifying them correctly. So one example that I like is also a soldier's uniform. Okay, in a museum, in a war museum, and then there's a blood stain. Do you remove that blood stain or not? Because blood has a lot of iron, right? It's causing a lot of iron corrosion. Okay, it's causing this deteriorating the cloth itself. Do you remove that? But the blood itself is of um, the soldier himself, of that period. It's real blood shed during the World War II or something. Do you remove the blood? What can you do about his blood? Or well, actually, they remove it and just put something else black, just splash red paint over it to pretend to be the blood. So that visually, it appears the same, but condition-wise, but condition you are actually helping it. So those are things that we actually talk about, and which is why in the fine arts conservation, um, conservators also actually have artist interview with the artist in terms of knowing what materials that they use behind how they use um, this and that materials and how it influenced them because then there's also the ethical concerns of how they want it to be viewed, like especially installation pieces. There's one artwork whereby um, this person actually, this leather glove, he put in a lot of um, grain of sand, a uh, grain of rice inside, but because it was, uh, uh, um, of course, not well conditioned, so there was actually uh, insects coming over and all that stuff. So is it very important that you fill up with ice? Can I fill up with some plastic bubble or whatever, just to give you that solid fill up form or not? So all that, concerns that sometimes we don't make them ourselves. Um, so be it the curators or the collection manager or the artists themselves, they are also the stakeholders. So when it comes to religious items, it's always more tricky. And another thing I more have in mind would be something I shared some time back. Um, this this um, parchment scroll, um, 
I can't remember which country, but because there's a religious connotation and it undergone, underwent several conservation in different periods in time and different things were done to it. So at its last stage, it was actually separated into 12 pieces uh, inside a microclimate environment box uh, that's illuminated with light. And when it first concerned, when we first separated, people were angry about it because it's a religious scroll that they read out during one of the event, one of the festivals itself. So it has religious meaning. But when it moved into the national collection, um, it becomes an artifact rather than a religious connotation. So what the conservator did, because all that rolling and rolling is going to causing more damage and deformity. Um, so actually it wasn't one single parchment. The public was slightly uh, misinformed. It's actually stitched together of separate pieces. So what the person did was he separated the pieces. So again, then you had to look at the context of a lot of that and the stakeholders involved and what is the best course of action. And of course, views change along the way as well. So that's when things get changed. So in terms of approach for the manuscripts, for Islamic manuscripts, um, well, I would say that we don't have that a lot in the National Archives collection itself. So my, uh, my exposure to them will be my own personal exposure and not through work. So I have not really um, so worked on them that much. Mm. HCC and National Archives are different agencies. I, and they have the bulk of the manuscripts collection. Okay, so uh, National Archives, okay, NAS for short. We used to be under NHB. Okay. But of course, you know, when they move things around, we are now under NLB. Ah, yeah, so we are under, under the National Library Board and KCC is still under NHB. Okay. So they take care of all the museum, the national collection. collection. We just take care of all the archival collections. Okay. Mm. Okay. Understand. Okay. Okay. Well, actually, I have a question, but ah. I don't know if I'm taking up too much time. Oh. Uh, is it related to that? Yeah. <laughs> oh, can I ask? Yeah, of course. Okay. No, actually, I mean, what you've just shared is uh -huh. so fascinating to me, right? And uh, because also, I. You know, I'm part of an independent archive, and I, uh, I guess the kind of like sort of like conversation that all these independent archives have, mm. the kind of like networks that they form, uh, they don't often also sort of like get uh, have this kind of like level of sort of like conversation mm -hmm. or the opportunity to be exposed to this kind of like knowledge or thinking, right, about conservation, or or maybe there's not that sort of opportunity. To to be in conversation with this kind of work, but I got the sense that you are also part of this larger kind of like network. I was wondering, like, can you give us a sense of like what is this uh, uh, this sort of like cohort that you are building, perhaps regionally, that's going to help tell me to sort of like set up all these sort of standards or some of some kind of like consensus around mm. this idea of conservation and. What are the opportunities for all these independent archives to actually be participating and learning from uh, mm. what is actually very sort of like, you know, useful work mm. for all these, uh, at least on some levels for all these uh, independent archives to adopt as mm. best practices on some level. Okay. So, uh, my own calculation, there's less than 80 conservators in Singapore. Mm. Yeah, and half of them are at HCC. <laughs> well, well, whereas uh, my team back at the National Archive is, is only seven of us, so the remaining are the private ones. In fact, uh, um, way less than 80 itself. So, um, the is private... In Singapore. Mm, in Singapore. Southeast Asia, well, that's the thing, because there's not much um, training, professional training mm -hmm. opportunities itself. So, a lot of them are like so-called preservation officer and all that stuff. They pick up pieces here and there. Occasionally, their bosses might actually bring in a conservator for some training. They might send them off and come back. But uh, qualifications is another story altogether because for, some, for, for Asians to go to the US or the UK for their conservation course, it's going to cost the institution a lot of money mm. itself. So, so not many of them had that opportunity. So um, that's always tricky. But in terms of what we can do at a lower scale um, uh, was actually a talk I gave last year on caring for your personal collection. Mm. So on a lower personal level, how the little, small little tidbits here and there, not quite what conservators do, but what you as a collector, uh, 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 or your own just personal one, two bookshelves or books that you want that you can actually look out for in terms of caring for your collections itself. And then on the network aspect, that will probably be uh, related to, to a similar topic on how Nasri came to me was um, uh, presented on uh, rethinking and readapting, re rethinking environmental standards for Southeast Asia at a symposium last year, which 
I wanted to rally our ASEAN neighbors and say, hey, we need to write our own ISO, you know, that's for our climate and not the ISO that's written by the West for the West countries. So um, they all had, yeah, yeah, yeah. But there wasn't any, any reaction. <laughs> Typical, right? Be I mean, because there's always this struggle with management that uh, when you change, when you move away from so-called international standards, then they're like, why are you changing? Why are you not using the ISO? And you say our environment is different, but management is always wanting to um, stick to the West and uh, um, something tried and proven, you know, they feel more safe and secure with that. So, so this is why even the conservators and the preservation managers, they know about that, but it's very hard to win management, which is the same case I did in, in, in the archives as well, which is why I presented at, at that symposium, so that I can do it outside in, instead of inside out. So there's always that, that struggle and to fight for. And then on, in terms of independent archives, right, um, I think awareness really helps. There's a lot of online free resources and communities. Um, and of course, the right materials. Like, I mean, bare minimum, having that awareness helps you make better decisions. So personally, I'm a hoarder. But if you organize your hoarding, you're a collector. Right. <laughs> so, so, uh, so if so, I'm, I'm in that case, right? Then on my way to being a collector. So I also want to do what I can for my home because I have no aircon at home. So I just do what I can. Like, oh, I'm a conservator. I can't, I can't, I can't have it in this man. I need to be. But of course, limited. I can't have 24/7 aircon. I only have aircon seven hours, eight hours a day. And, and I, the the sun comes into my room. So what can I do, right? Um, all the UV filter and everything, and the fan, air circulation, I do what I can within my means. Which, uh, which I, think, um, I think just two months ago, the National Library had some internal symbol, um, in symposium, and then someone shared about, um, this professor shared about this independent art archive in, um, not archive, I think it was a political archive in Indonesia and one in Malaysia and all that stuff and very different, very distinctly different. You, some you see very neat boxes, some are just like all over the place and all that stuff and, and I, I guess it really is a lot of money and effort but I think even for a lot of institutions, uh, even what we call historical houses in the UK, they have a lot of volunteers, they don't really have an uh, in-house conservator so they actually engage um, volunteers, retirees and housewives who will be given um, some basic training and they will do the surface cleaning. So every year, there will be a bunch of um, Thai Thais, la, so to speak, right? Thai Thais who will take the book from the shelf, they will brush the surface dust off, and then they put it back in. Yeah. So of course, there's a certain level of work that can be shared by everybody with awareness. Because uh, if you do things the wrong way, you're just going to introduce and distribute, redistribute the dust instead, instead of like, trying to keep it off your collections. Uh, 
going, uh, it seems that it should be governed by very objective measures. Uh, it seems also very, uh, not, I don't know if instinctive is the word, but it almost seems quite uh, uh, very open ended. You mentioned a couple of times if there was a situation where there was a man which is in very bad shape, that we would then just leave it to perhaps a time in which there would be mm -hmm. better technology that would come into place, for example. And I mean, just to sort of link that to your example of the video that was found in National Archives, that it, there wasn't a definitive understanding of what the video was showing at the time. So it was very much left then perhaps to the possibility that then someone would then pick up and then be able to decipher that properly. So I thought that was interesting because it then sort of configures our understanding of collections a bit differently, where it's not just a source of uh, definitive knowledge, but it can actually be very much collaborative. Uh, it can invite uh, uh, queries, not uh, uh, it can invite uh, more answers in the future, not only from people of the institution, but people like ourselves, uh, uh, researchers, you know, uh, housewives, volunteers, and things like that. So it's it's. Uh, I wonder if that's something that you think is is is. is you know, does that sound valid, or you know? I, I, I really think that's a part of the whole 1970s kind of like. Call it in some way museology, right? or even the word museology <coughs> is sort of like being introduced. Uh, that's a very 1970s kind of like moment where uh, you begin seeing like the, the, the removal of the kind of like distinct curatorial sort of like voids as an authoritative voice into sort of receiving that kind of validating that kind of like opportunity to more sort of like collaborative way of thinking through exhibition of collection, uh, in the speaking of exhibition. So uh, the, the, the definition, the, the, this development that Simon is referring to is uh, the definition that is put forth by ICOM. Uh, is it ICOM? Yes, yeah. ICOM, yes. Uh, earlier this year, where uh, they were basically taking of uh, uh, proposing a new definition of what a museum should be. Uh, and to my understanding, when they recently had the meeting uh, a few months ago, that it was actually, it actually fell through. Oh, 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 uh, it was also a book. Right, oh, there you go. Could you, do you remember the definitions? Could you yeah, guys share yeah. with uh, everyone? It's a very long definition. Um, yes, I thought it was fast. No, it wasn't yeah. fast. Basically, there was too many people who were posting these definitions, <laughs> um, and the book fell through. So it was a book that was also a book. There's quite a few more updates from my phone account where they um, so it's both more expenses and the 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 video was just uh the By the any case, what do you think of this new proposal? Maybe the chat will answer this. Let's have you share the because it's quite a long definition. Yeah, it's really long. Um so it's in two paragraphs. Uh the museums are there. Generations and guarantee equal rights and equal access to heritage for all people. 
So, um, uh, so, so my understanding of, of the debate uh, and you can add it uh, if, if it's uh, if reach you want. The, my understanding was that uh, some of the disagreement uh, from the participating members was not so much with the, the sentiment of the definition, but really uh, uh, the purpose of the definition. And then, and so I think for, to, to that end, some people said that if it was going to be there for goals and long and like that, then it wouldn't work so well as a, as a definition that it shouldn't say these kinds of things. So I think it's a very, very complex uh, issue. Uh, of course, uh, you know, I, I think um, if you would ask for my opinion, uh, I can briefly say that I think the Malay Heritage Center is uh, quite, I think, uh, it, it, if anything, it is, it's well placed to be able to sort of engage in, in the discussion about uh, these things, particularly on the matter of acquisitions, collections, and exhibitions, precisely because of the, I guess, sort of the mandate that we've been given, which makes it easier in the sense of grappling with other challenge, some challenges that other museums might be facing in terms of uh, uh, bureaucratically, uh, 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 I guess, uh, politically, and things like that. So I. I wouldn't say it's more than that, mm. but, but it's it's definitely a move that's encouraged. But I think it's it's easy. It's there's a lot of things that sort of need to be worked out, and, uh, involving a lot of people. It sounds like it's it, it, you know on the surface it sounds like it's a shift that would uh, uh, presumably sort of um, have implications on the museum, but I think it has much implications on uh, the community actually. Right. Yeah. Um, so so that. Um, I, on that note, uh, perhaps we can sort of open it up uh, if anyone has any questions and responses to what's been shared, uh, you know, uh, feel free to just uh, let loose and then, yeah, yeah, what's up? Hi, um, I have two questions. One, um, I think it's important to be clear about Something uh, ready? Yeah, I can find much question I ask this would be so that much shorter. Uh, in the sense uh, if you were to sort of like go to uh Pariyama or uh Beku in Sumatra uh, during the Mohammed celebration, would this still sort of like commonly practice there? Of course that is also a kind of like divine tradition that really began during the Tukano period in the 1970s where there was a Interest to sort of like push in some of the other tourism. And so uh, ironically and paradoxically, because of that, it has sort of like a new survive as a sort of annual like celebration. So it was a very sort of quite lucky event in terms of chance to sort of like go and see the Mohammed celebrations uh, in Mekulu and Faria. And, uh, and, and that's the only reason why it continues to survive, basically. Uh, if you go to Ache, that was like gone, you go to other kind of small so lost uh, in the balance of like area. So it's that is the kind of, that the celebration that used to be there and now it's really gone because of you know the persecution of sh 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 shady women and all these kind of like um, uh, really kind of like you know, very clear separation between the city and the Shia practice. Well, of course, in Malaysia it's gone, in Singapore it's gone. So in the archives, we call everything a record. In the museums, they call everything an artifact. But conservators usually we just call anything and everything an object. <laughs> so in terms of the object, I always remind my colleagues, it's not what you as a conservator, what you want to do, but what does the object need from you. 
So the respect first and foremost is definitely to the object itself. Um, it needs it needs to be clean, it needs to be balanced. It, it prefers this or that rather than what we try to impose upon the object itself. So um, I have a few short slides I did in then sharing with our colleagues from some time ago with the ASEAN friends. Okay, it's almost three years ago. So basically I did talk about um, housing and storage and giving respect uh, in response to the resources that is available with our neighbours as well because 24 7 aircon is impossible. A lot of these buildings have no air conditioning but of course if you look at all the Soviet Asian, the older structures, how things are like, um, the houses are not on the ground like Malay Kampung houses also, everything is very sub. And of course, um, the architecture, the up of it and all that stuff that's, that provides and encourages ventilation and wind. So things that I reminded um, our ASEAN friends is that we can't do everything what the West uh, do. Um, neither do we have to as well. You need to do what we, within your own means. So things like furniture with raised legs. Um, even like uh, a lot of times, the, they are wrapped in silk. Or in fact, this silk are actually dyed with um, turmeric. So for example, you can see here, they are inside repairing. They have natural properties in certain materials um, that is already inherent. So except for things like, some people say, oh, put your manuscripts in the box, put them near the kitchen because the soup will keep the rats away. Well, that is true. Um, we actually tell them maybe not because then there's a soot surface. Um, the soot itself is very difficult to remove. And also um, the heat can cause other forms of damage. So I told them, I shared with our Sam friends that do not reject everything completely, but not everything traditional is necessarily a good idea. So the main thing is understand what are you putting. They have little little bags that put different kind of things like um, camphor oil and different materials and all that to help keep pests away. But of course, to understand what a work one doesn't. And of course, to do further testing why it works and why it doesn't. Which is why in conservation right now, we actually use with starch paste, which is used in a traditional Chinese and Japanese scroll mounting instead of using uh, those kind of um, archival glue and materials. Same reason, why are we going back to the traditional? But not everything traditional is good either. So knowing why you do the things you do. So in terms of the indigenous practices and the materials, I think there's definitely a lot more to explore about it that is not completely wrong either and definitely a lot to, to really see why it works and why it doesn't. And in fact, um, different regions use different materials in their little silk box they put inside which they put inside the box with the manuscripts with um, because of what is available in their region as well. So not everything is usable. So example, even the Japanese, they use this particular wood that's very good that has also inherent insect repellent properties and this is where they scroll their, uh, all their scrolls in. Not just any kind of wooden box, but a particular kind of wood itself. So all that um, requires a more thorough understanding of the materials and your resources rather than just uh, because this is, it came with it, it has to be doing it together. Or because, because uh, um, if it's not really doing a good job of pre preserving, you might actually still keep it for provenance, but separately, those are other ways around things, or how we try to not just um, chuck everything aside. Mm. I hope it answers. Okay, uh, too short. Okay, uh, there are a few ways of replying there. First of all, I'm not a painting conservator. <laughs> uh, I, I did intern a short couple of months for painting conservation. Um, okay, the part of restoration again is it's how much do you want to do? And of course, if you are the owner or a collector, then you can actually go to a painting conservator who will actually repair the losses, the, the whole of it. And then in terms of the paint itself, where it's already gone as well, it depends on how much do you want, to what degree. So what the conservator do usually is that they will actually add a barrier layer first instead of directly applying on. And then um, if you do not mind, if you see it more as less ethical and more like personal value, then they will paint it in because they're painting it on a new material, the hole that they repaired and not on the original canvas. So there's less of an issue. So they will try to match the colors and the toning, but they will do it in a different way. So they might actually be doing pointillism or if you look at um, Italy, all the wall paintings, sometimes they do cross hatching so that visually from a distance it's not distracting you from your interpretation. But we have the so called three feet, three inch rule, three inches away, the conservator will be able to spot that it is a repair and not original. Mm. So that is also part of our ethics in terms of conservation versus restoration. Because restoration, uh, it looks like it's part of the original, you can't tell at all. 
But for conservation, mm, yeah, I see it. You know, so so there's also the aspect. So depending on how much you want, so it can be done because it's on the new material than the old material. Because if it's the old material, pain and pain will touch. So what kind of interaction? Is it the same kind of pain? We age the same way because it's oil painting. You use acrylic. Then uh, uh, when they age, when it dark, when the color darkens, we influence it as well. Yeah. So there are many considerations for a conservator. Uh, this is the sun. Okay, yeah. um, there's actually an anthropological essay about uh, about a ghost in a sugar mill machine in the early twentieth century. Yeah, and, and the ghost was also carrying a watch. Yeah, so oh, yeah, I didn't know that. that. Uh, uh, John, John Campbell. I think uh, uh, that's where we get it. Oh, cool. Yeah, but it was like yes, like there was something in the maybe the early twentieth century, early twentieth century. Was or we're actually doing these supernatural qualities on clocks. On clocks, right? Okay, yeah, that's an interesting idea. But I imagine that's in Japanese context, right? Which the sugar mill does then take on the spectral kind of like quality. I mean, it's also a very quick, I mean, the icon that the term describes it as a very colonial, you know, a, spe a, a space of colonial power and uh, one. And the uh, water tea, which also becomes Let's let's see more about this. that right um i'm not sure is this still ongoing because uh, our, our colleagues was doing this picture sg last year and basically 
people are a lot of photos for people to describe. And like you said, young people like us sometimes, I don't recognize that place, that building in the photo. And you really need someone of a certain age and experience to be able to identify it correctly. But assuming that their memory is correct too, lah, right? So there's always that involved whereby even a subject expert, um, you can only pick out things that identify bits and pieces. And um, in fact, like the synopsis and description sometimes are not done by staff. Uh, it could be like 10 staff. And also, I know for the photograph, um, the photograph collection, there is a button that it can say that, or oh, report saying that, oh, it's a wrong description. But I guess that's missing from the audiovisual archive, perhaps. So, um, so it really matters a lot, especially the photographs. The fact that you're mm. this, this mm. is the oldest thing that we have shared on the archive. So if I took my job, I mean, you know, we made the announcement that, okay, let's just think that's not from the internet. And then I was like, okay, let's see what you have here. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's see what you have. So I sort of like, you know, put in the time period, which I get the oldest stuff. And then the first thing that pops up is that, uh, that uh, video. And then I was looking at it, I thought, oh, seeing a Chinese New Year's for the black celebration. And to my job, it was something else. Even better. Even better. <laughs> so it was like, yay, jackpot. <laughs> <laughs> so that, 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 that thing about sort of like sharing these things online, we really do have sort of like a lot of news, but then we also sort of just tapping into local knowledge. Mm -hmm. I think we well, it's actually because in Malaysia, you know, we forget a lot of stuff, but we cannot show it. Mm. And mm. they're not showing it. Chances are, I'm not getting exposed to it as much as you're not showing it. Was it 1907? 1909. 1909. Do you remember which collection of who was it? Uh, mm. Yeah, because uh, to my knowledge, the oldest video you have is actually of a Prakan wedding, it's a home video. So, so you realize that a lot of the photos and videos sometimes that is not in government based or materials come from the individual themselves. And if the children didn't throw them away when the parents pass away, um, then we are very lucky to have them. But if not, so which is why um, this is a, okay. This is okay. This is just before Chinese New Year. So, um, if any relatives, old people, and all that stuff, you know, um, when they are no longer around, before you throw anything out contact the museums or curators or conservators. We'll help you decide which one goes to where, okay? I Don't should, just throw them away. I, I should add it, so the, the video that I showed was actually a truncated version. In a sense, there is a middle portion which is taken over, of the Singapore River. So there is a section of it that is highly, of the double celebration that will be cut up uh, by this uh, view of the, the scene of the Singapore mm -hmm. River. Uh, we will be able to see that watch the entire video. Um, but it's always really clear that it's possible to the fact that we get this out. I wonder when this was sort of a big over. Do we have any more responses or questions? No, I, I think uh, we should wrap it up there in terms of time. But I guess Simon will be here for a couple of minutes if you have any more questions. Uh, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, we have surveys for you to fill out, as always. Uh, my colleague is behind, so please give us a favor. If you have any suggestions or ideas for programs, please let us know.